All right, our YouTube live is is going and, and so is um, is the webinar. So people just should be, it looks like people are filing in. We'll just wait a couple of minutes while everyone gets All right, situated. Our YouTube live. I think we're uh, ready to to get started. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, to our uh, spring programming for the series. Understanding Systemic Racism. The Institute for Comparative Literature, together with the Ambedkar Initiative, introduced uh, this lecture series to reflect on the roots of racial discrimination, class oppression, colonial injustice, and other forms of institutionalized impunity against peoples of color in the fall. We stress the importance of opening the US-centered conversations surrounding race and identity, towards a broad and comparative reckoning with racism and its violent histories around the world, while taking inspiration from the anti-caste legacy of B.R. Ambedkar to reflect on his continued relevance to discussions about social justice, affirmative action, and democratic thinking in a, in a uh, global frame. Now our focus this semester is on the world-making capacity of words images and sound. The aesthetic, like the economic, the social, and the political, is a distinctive domain of praxis. One of the definitions of aesthesis is feeling. Others have argued that the aesthetics is itself a mode, or the aesthetic is itself a mode of ordering, which marks the divide between the sensible and the insensible, an argument that the philosopher Jacques Rancière has made. Now, caste, embodied, granular, tactile, produces a crisis of representation because it puts the social itself under erasure. How then do we imagine and experiment with new forms of affinity, solidarity, formations of touch and intimacy? What is the relation between ethics and aesthetics? These are just some of the questions that we hope to consider across our programming this term. I'd like to thank our, uh, the ongoing support of our sponsors, the Barnard Provost's Office, the Deans of Humanities and the Social Sciences at Columbia, the EVP uh, at Columbia University, AADS, CSER, MISAS, IRCPL, and the Columbia Libraries and CU Press for supporting the Ambedkar Initiative. Um, I would also very much like to welcome uh, our participants for our conversation today on passing and personhood and for kicking us off uh, with our spring programming. Uh, I'm briefly going to mention them merely by name and institutional uh, affiliation. Uh, I think all of you know their work uh, they are well known to all of us. Uh, and so in order to reduce Zoom fatigue and to give them a chance to speak, uh, I'm just going to introduce them very briefly. The idea is uh, that uh, Joel and uh, K. Satyanarana, Joel Lee teaches at Williams College. K. Satyanarana teaches at the English and Foreign Languages University in Hyderabad. And we have a moderator and a discussant, Balmurli Natrajan, who teaches at William Patterson University. Now, Joel and Satya are actually together in the same place at the same time, which is wonderful. 
And so what we wanted to do uh, to take advantage of this uh, wonderful opportunity is to really put them in conversation. Uh, they are each, they're going to structure their uh, comments, conversation, contribution today as a kind of dialogue uh, where they will go back and forth and take up a number of issues uh, related to their ongoing collaborative work on this project on passing and personhood. They'll speak for about 40, 45 minutes in this uh, format, experimental, given our theme uh, for this, uh, for today and for this term. And then Murali, I hope, will uh, make a, have a few comments and intervene, uh, maybe for about 10, 12, 15 minutes. We would then like to open up for conversation. What I will do thereafter is to collect uh, sort of clusters of questions, two or three broad sets of questions that I will pose to um, all of our participants today. Thank you again for joining us. And uh, we're really thrilled to host Joel, Satya, and uh, Balmurli uh, today. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. that kind introduction and uh, it's really, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be uh, part of this series. Um, and we recognize that it is, as Murli said just beforehand, this is a competitive Zoom environment. So we really deeply appreciate uh, each one of you for being here with us today. So for the last two years, uh, Satya and I have been collaborating on a project uh, working with a number of writers and translators, we've put together an anthology of Dalit writings on what we're calling, for the moment at least, caste concealment. This term translates a cluster of terms that appear in the stories and essays in our collection, especially the Hindi Jachupana or Jachupakerehna uh, and the Marathi Jevami Jachorli, meaning when I concealed my caste, which is, of course, the title of a well-known short story by Babu Rao Bagul, happily included in our volume. In our book, we argue that writings on caste concealment actually constitute a rich and substantial thematic genre within Dalit literature, and that this genre bears comparison with the genre in the African-American literary canon on passing, or the unperceived transgression of hierarchical boundaries in the American racial context. Dalit writings on caste concealment, we want to suggest throw light on a set of social practices as ubiquitous and consequential as they are under acknowledged and under theorized. They afford us a new entry point for the critical analysis of this monstrously complex problem of caste, illuminating it from an unexpected angle, like a hidden camera. Uh, these works portray a whole world of experience hiding, as it were, in plain sight. So today what we'd like to do uh, is to introduce some of the richness and complexity of the material we're putting forward in this anthology, to offer a little bit of suggestive commentary, and above all, to inaugurate a discussion. We very much see our book as a conversation opener, a kind of, uh, the, the, you know, the, the beginning of a debate. Uh, and so we'd like to offer our remarks today in the same spirit. Uh, taking advantage of the, this gift of actually being together in the same place at the same time here in Hyderabad, uh, we, um, uh, we're gonna tack back and forth uh, sort of two sections each on the content and contexts of the book. And then we'll do one round each of sort of reading um, a, a passage from, from the selections. So let me start by just sketching the basic outlines of the book and, uh, and, and pointing to a few of the questions that it raises. Uh, and then Satya will situate it in the context of Dalit literature. So our anthology contains 20 selections, uh, mostly from Marathi, Hindi, Malayalam, Telugu, Tamil, and Bengali, as well as a few originally composed in English. Uh, Half of our collection are fictional short stories. The other half are autobiographical essays or excerpts from autobiographies. This drawing together of thematically united but formally disparate genres is of course intentional, uh, part of a deliberate effort to bring social scientists and scholars of literature into a joint discussion, something we have found uh, to be very fruitful. 
Uh, it also invites a productive meditation on narrative self-fashioning as it relates to social self-fashioning, uh, messing with genre boundaries in a way that passing literature has always done, even so far back as uh, James Weldon Johnson's 1912 novel entitled Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man. The autobiographical essays in our collection range from the late colonial period to the Instagram age. Uh, at one book end, we have Dr. Bhimrao Ambedkar's essay, Waiting for a Visa, in which he describes, after returning from his studies abroad, having to adopt a Parsi name and persona in order to obtain something as basic as shelter in Baroda. At the other end, we have Yashika Dutt's powerful recent memoir in which she describes years of subterfuge and fear of discovery until her coming out as Dalit, as she arrestingly titles her book, after a personal reckoning provoked by the suicide of Rohit Bemula. The stories and essays in the volume portray a whole range of situations that bring concealment into play. In some, Dalit characters are merely flirting with the prospect of concealment or even unintentionally eliciting recognition as quote unquote high caste. Other accounts depict lives that are painfully and painstakingly bifurcated between a Dalit identity at home and a privileged caste persona at school or in the workplace or in the neighborhood. And in a few, we encounter individuals who have gone all the way as it were. Uh, severing ties to their communities of birth or marrying without their spouse knowing their origins. This continuum raises a host of questions. In what ways is caste status not inherited, but enacted? When upper casteness can be persuasively performed, then the elements of performance can be identified. What ensemble of acts enables the sovereign or the splendid people as they're known in several vernaculars to command the esteem they routinely do? How does caste, which is still portrayed in many circles as a rural vestige of a crumbling uh, feudal order, not only operate but thrive in the urban educated middle-class milieus that many of our stories depict? Does the anonymity of the city open pathways for casteless sociality? The tenuous friendships and troubled romances in these narratives raise further questions. How does caste structure the contours and even the possibility of human intimacy? Yeah, so I would like to uh, suggest uh, that this idea of concealment is not a practice of some group of uh, uh, Dalits or Dalit characters. And this is, uh, uh, I think, a practice that all marginalized groups, all Dalit characters have to go through at one point or the, or the other. And this is one, one of the main points. So because of uh, this assumption that I'm making, I would like to locate uh, this entire discussion in the context of uh, the history of the representation of Dalit character. And as you know, uh, within Dalit criticism, uh, the representation of Dalit characters is one of the uh, central uh, key issues uh, that the Dalit writers and critics have uh, debated uh, over the years. So within the uh, Dalit critical uh, space, uh, concealment is seen uh, very negatively. It is not seen as a positive uh, uh, performance. It is seen as a uh, performing of a negative uh, identity, uh, non-political, uh, and in fact, imitative of the uh, Brahminical ideology. And uh, these characters are seen as uh, internalizing caste ideology and the display inferiority. And, and these, uh, 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 this hiding of this caste is basically for uh, self-advancement. Uh, and these characters never assert, they never demand uh, dignity. So in other words, the larger point is that uh, caste concealment reinforces the caste order and the caste uh, assigned roles. And, and in fact, uh, uh, the caste concealment seen, uh, is seen as uh, escapism in some sense. It's unethical, it, it is immoral uh, in the uh, Amitkarite and other uh, Dalit circles. So given this uh, understanding of uh, uh, caste uh, concealment, uh, I would like to go back a little bit and see the discussion on the Dalit uh, character, uh, as I mentioned. That the early uh, Dalit critics, uh, I think, reviewed uh, a representation of uh, Dalits in Indian uh, literature. 
uh, fiction and other kinds of writings. And, and of course, all of you are familiar with uh, Mulkaraj Anand's Baka, or uh, Takalisar Singh Pillai's uh, 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 Matu in uh, Scavenger's Son, or of course, the well-known Prem Chin's uh, uh, Kafan, two Dalit characters in that. And, uh, and several of the, these kinds of uh, uh, characters. So the Dalit critique is in terms of uh, how uh, these characters are uh, objects of pity. These characters have no uh, assertive uh, nature and, and they're submissive and they don't demand uh, dignity uh, and so on and so forth. And they, are, they, 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 they really display uh, uh, traits of inferiority and so on. So in other words, uh, certain kinds of Dalit characters are uh, totally out of the discussion in, 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 in Dalit criticism. Uh, and with the arrival of uh, the Ambedkarite hero, uh, as Babura Bagal and his very well-known uh, essay on Dalit literature, uh, Dalit literature is but human literature in the Poison Mud collection. It's a very classic, important uh, statement on, on, on both uh, a survey of Indian literature and also to make this point that uh, the Dalit, uh, the Dalit is the Ambedkarite uh, hero. So the meaning of Dalit is in sharp contrast to the dominant view of the untouchable, as Bagul puts it, as I quote, someone who is mean, despicable, contemptible, sinful due to his deeds in his past life. Someone who is seen as poor, humiliated, and without history. In contrast, the Dalit is a self-conscious, autonomous and assertive individual. And the term actually Bagul uses is uh, Ambedkarite hero and who rejects his or her, her fat list existence with its demeaning names, occupations, and practices, and demands self-respect, equality, and freedom. This new identity, Dalit, offers a positive self-definition and rejects stigmatized, dehumanized, and humiliating uh, identities. So in some sense, the Ambedkarite hero occupies the center stage uh, in, in Dalit's literary uh, uh, representation. And the, the, the flip side of it is, the, is that then either you have the pitiable objects or the Ambedkarite rebels, and then a large number of other kinds of Dalit characters are not part of the debate. And particularly those who conceal their caste are seen very negatively, they, they are, they're out of uh, discussion. And you have, uh, there are other uh, kinds of characters, for example, who have become part of the Ambedkarite uh, tradition, Ambedkarite Dalit literary tradition, uh, with some uh, struggle, some negotiation. For example, you take uh, the classic case of Limbales Akarmashi. So in Limbales Akarmashi, it's a, both a problem to conceal, uh, it's also a problem to reveal. So there's nothing for Limbale to reveal that he's a Dalit and so on, because he's, he's a, a bastard child born to a, a Patil a father and a Mahar a mother. So it is, so the identity itself is not easily accessible, available like uh, the other Dalits. And because of the, uh, the, the relationship between a Patil uh, father and, and a Mahar mother and, and an oppressive uh, kind of relationship. So uh, he has to make it public. He has to write his own story uh, and, and try to name the father, try to reveal the caste of the father and caste of the mother. Uh, which really attracted opposition from both, both the mother and the father uh, uh, objected to that. And then this really reveals this interesting, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, undermining the bond boundaries of the form of autobiography and also undermining the boundaries of the caste uh, society itself. And it really tells you that the identity formation, uh, it, it involves a process of uh, uh, violence and identity is really identification. Finally, he becomes an Ambedkarite through his identification. And he makes claims to his metalineal uh, Ambedkarite uh, kind of lineage and becomes an Ambedkar. And you have yet another uh, version of that Ambedkarite hero in Narendra Jadav's uh, uh, Outcast, where one could also claim that you could be a global citizen and a citizen with, with no caste and no claim to any caste. But in this entire frame of uh, Dalit critical discussion, uh, the, uh, the Dalit characters who conceal their caste or who perform caste differently, and they are absent.
one of the pieces in, in our collection is the very well-known uh, autobiographical essay by Kumud Pode, The Story of My Sanskrit. <clears throat> uh, and I just want to read a, a bit from this, which is, is not usually the bit that people remember. Uh, but in The Story of My Sanskrit, uh, Pode describes a moment in her school days when she visited the home of her high school Sanskrit teacher, whom she portrays as a benevolent but traditionalist Brahmin, uh, who lives in a Brahmin neighborhood of Nagpur. Though the teacher knows Pade's caste, she suspects that his family does not. So when she goes for this visit, uh, once she's in their home, upon noting the Brahminical observances that her teacher's wife and children observe, uh, and the teacher himself is not present, uh, she begins to fear what might ensue as her teacher's wife and children offer her food and drink. So here's a quote from the, from the book. Um, I became nervous. Fear crept over my mind. Suppose this lady were to find out my caste. Along with sips of water, I swallowed the lump in my throat as well as mouthfuls of poha. I couldn't concentrate on what anyone was saying. My only worry was when and how I could escape from there. Suppose someone from the Bubi area, that is her own neighborhood, were to come here. God deliver me from this ordeal. I kept praying to the Almighty. So in this excerpt, uh, as well as in, this, this is actually in quite a few of the, something along these lines is in several of the stories in our collection. Uh, it's in Babu Babu's When I Hid My Cast, in the selection from uh, Koshoya Baisantri's Doubly Cursed, and there's also a piece from Omprakash Valmiki's Jutan that reflects a similar situation in which we encounter a situation where everyday hospitality becomes this kind of affectively charged nightmare. Uh, the narrator, whose Dalitness remains undetected, suffers paralyzing fear tinged with outrage, grounded in a reasonable apprehension of danger. In these scenes, ironically, the more elaborate and affectionate the ministrations of the host, the more terrifying the experience of the guest. Now consider Nella Larson's acclaimed 1929 novel, Passing, a pillar of the uh, the, the African-American passing literature, literary canon. The protagonist, Irene, becomes reacquainted with her childhood friend, Claire Kendry, after a hiatus of many years, and is invited home to have tea with her and to meet her husband. Claire and, her, uh, Claire and Irene are both light-skinned, but whereas Irene remains part of the African-American milieu in which she was raised, Claire has concealed her origins and married a, white, a wealthy white businessman who openly espouses racist ideas. At the tea party, uh, Irene is compelled to um, you know, conceal origins in order to protect Claire. Now, upon one of Claire's husband's racist remarks, uh, here's a passage, or several pieces from a passage that I'll put together. Irene's lips trembled almost uncontrollably. A faint sense of danger brushed her like the breath of a cold fog. An onlooker, Irene reflected, would have thought it a most congenial tea party, all smiles and jokes and hilarious laughter. There was a brief silence during which she feared that her self-control was about to prove too frail a bridge to support her mounting anger and indignation. She had a leaping desire to shout at the man beside her. The impulse passed, obliterated by her consciousness of the danger in which such rashness would involve Claire. It was, Irene thought, unbelievable and astonishing that four people could sit so unruffled, so ostensibly friendly, while they were in reality seething with anger, mortification, shame. So just a few words on the comparative impulse here. Uh, in putting these uh, kinds of texts together, um, we want to suggest that, that we see tremendous potential in, in reading uh, the stories and essays in our anthology alongside passing narratives in American literature. Such works, of course, as Larson's novel Passing, uh, Jean Toomer's Kane, James Weldon Johnson, Johnson's The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man, Jesse Fawcett's Plum Bun, Langston Hughes has several passing stories, and others. Indeed, in our introduction to the book, we, we propose several particular pairings that might be particularly fruitful. But to propose juxtaposition and comparative study of what we consider literary and cultural analogs is not uh, 
is not to lose sight of or to collapse crucial historical and structural distinctions, nor do we want to compel the thus far less studied phenomenon to uh, sort of immediately conform to the analytical framework the better known phenomenon has generated. So this is one reason that we're uh, working with the term caste concealment rather than leaping immediately to say caste passing as an overly hasty comparativism that might uh, lead one to do. Passing uh, in, the, in the US context has tended to be theorized in one of three ways. First, as a subversive deconstruction of hierarchy that exposes the falsehood of essential racial difference. This is a mode of analysis well represented in literary studies. Second, as a kind of Faustian bargain, uh, not the undermining, but actually the reproduction of a racial order that gives no quarter to ambiguity and rewards those perceived as dominant only on the condition that they repudiate the subordinate. This kind of interpretation is represented in the historical sociology of Henry Louis Gates Jr. when writing about such figures as Jean Toomer and Anatole Broyard. Third is the theorization of passing as an intensified variety of what the sociologist Irving Goffman famously calls impression management. This latter move importantly situates passing at the heart of the human condition. Uh, if, if we're all in all of our social interactions all of the time, guarding against revealing aspects of ourselves that would be taken as discreditable, then we can all identify to varying degrees with those who pass. So all of this we find very helpful. These approaches and others, uh, including some really great work by uh, Sandra Harvey on the roots of passing, the passing trope in slavery, speak in various sometimes refracted ways uh, to the narratives in our anthology and can be profitably applied to the caste context as, as Satya is about to elaborate on. Uh, at the same time, we're interested in listening to the narratives in our collection for what they tell us about caste concealment on its own terms uh, and in developing theory from concepts embedded in the stories themselves. Yes, yeah, so to continue uh, uh, discussion on the Dalit character and the comparative uh, context. Uh, the self-conscious uh, 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 privileged caste position uh, and, and characters who, who really perform uh, uh, those kinds of uh, positions are self-conscious casteless kind of positions. I mean, those characters uh, uh, have not been debated uh, in the Dalit uh, literary criticism. And one reason I'm suggesting is that the Ambedkar, uh, Ambedkar hero, Ambedkar hero becomes a type, uh, uh, one uh, dominant kind of a character and representing uh, uh, entirely the Dalit uh, literature and, and, and Dalit life. And, and to actually kind of turn away from the, uh, the dominant Ambedkar character to other kinds of Dalit characters who are uh, uh, concealing, who are performing, who are, are doing different kinds of things. Uh, so this affinity uh, of racial passing with caste concealment, uh, we thought is, is very, very uh, uh, productive and uh, useful. And given uh, the earlier histories of both the Dalit Panther and Blank Panther conversations, and uh, uh, particularly I uh, want to refer to uh, Namdev uh, Vankade and Janardhan Vankade, both Dalit scholars of the uh, uh, 60s and 70s, and who uh, invoked African American literature as a, a mirror for Dalit writers. So, so the metaphor is a mirror that you actually look at it and try to self fashion and revise and critique, and, and, of, and of course, a number of other uh, uh, points that uh, uh, Vankade uh, highlighted, both the historic suffering as the center of both uh, these literary and social movements uh, and the labor uh, connection, and of course the double uh, consciousness and so on. So the, this particular uh, uh, affinity uh, between these two uh, literatures and the passing and the caste concealment. And of course the similarity uh, in terms of the, uh, the discussion on caste and race in, in that one context, uh, that the similarity and the affinity uh, that was uh, highlighted. So in, in that uh, spirit, in that context, uh, uh, so the debate and the parallel debate and passing really uh, 
uh, I think opens up this possibility to look at uh, the complex uh, uh, creative uh, kind of characters uh, from the lit life and literature who are uh, neither uh, the pitiable objects nor uh, Ambedkarite, but but there are different. So the multifaceted, uh, the complex Dalit characters who are not already uh, identified as a possible uh, rebellious types, I mean, those characters, uh, I think we could look at through uh, the possibility opened up by uh, by the, uh, the, the debate uh, on passing. I think one general assumption uh, uh, in terms of the cash concealment uh, uh, practice in real life and in literature is that, that it is an old a traditional uh, village bound kind of a practice. It's it's not something that if you are educated, if you are assertive, if you are modern, then, then you would not be concealing your cash. You will be asserting and so on. But the evidence really shows us in terms of both the real life personal uh, experiences of uh, you know, some of the Dalits and also literature really tells us uh, uh, that, that, that both uh, in the urban and rural context, so th this concealment continuously happening. As I already asserted earlier that there's no escape even for the Ambedkarite hero uh, to conceal his caste. So at some point or the other, uh, so everyone has to uh, go through this. Towards the end of this, I'll give you an example from my own uh, personal life to, to, to highlight that point. Uh, then two points uh, here is that, that there are a number of situations, uh, both uh, the experimental and contextual, uh, are deliberately uh, uh, performing. So the number of situations where uh, uh, the characters uh, uh, perform or conceal uh, cast, uh, and, and we have those uh, number of texts uh, for us. But two particular uh, uh, situations are themes that I want to highlight. One is what I called the identitarian, uh, identitarian performance, performing uh, the privileged caste self, the Brahminhood. Kshatriyanas uh, are more generally the high caste uh, uh, persona. And what is interesting about this is two points in relation to this. One is that the entire inventory of uh, everyday practices uh, and, and, and uh, the number of the symbols uh, of upper caste life that, that you really have to mobilize. In fact, we have a story uh, titled Parable of the Lost Data by Vinodhani, a Telugu uh, uh, Dalit woman writer, uh, where I think a Dalit Christian uh, 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 character a uh, woman character really uh, uh, kind of improvises uh, the styles of dress and, and uh, follows uh, the manners of speech, modes of experimental like a Brahmin and try to kind of uh, perform and, and live in the same house and, and, and do that. And then what are the consequences of that kind of a, uh, a performance? So, so this is one I mean, where you can really see that what is the meaning of uh, uh, you know, caste? Is it inherited, uh, birth-based? Or, or is it a set of signs that you really mobilize to, to, to really present uh, your subjectivity and what is the, the falseness or, 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 or the truth of this particular uh, uh, system and so on. Then of course, what really enables, uh, as in the case of uh, uh, the Dalit Christian woman is that there are a number of subject positions available. There are a number of ways in which you can really uh, shape your identity uh, and so on. And, and also in terms of how, uh, uh, you know, uh, skin color, name, occupation, diet, dialect, disposition, habits, political orientation, how all these play uh, a role in, in really performing uh, a particular uh, kind of a, an identity uh, and so on. And, so on. and uh, the, the, the one example that, and of course, one could say that these are all class uh, uh, symbols that you address education and certain things. So you can pass off as somebody. Yeah. One could say that you can conceal and you can present yourself as a citizen and so on, so which is not the case because uh, the, the class uh, uh, signs uh, uh, really doesn't allow you to pass off. And, and, and Ambedkar himself uh, is a great example for us in waiting for a visa. Uh, when he went to Baroda, so he wanted to rent a room, but he has to change his name and he has to also claim the Parsi identity uh, to get uh, a room and then finally uh, his identity was revealed, and then he was thrown out of that. So it it it, it is really uh, important that how you master these uh, signs and symbols, and how you perform this. And many times this performance also uh, uh, fails. So this is one aspect. The other aspect is that there are other uh, Dalit characters in life and literature uh, uh, who really uh, uh, perform this very creatively. 
for uh, for a certain kind of ambition for certain kind of uh, desire to uh, have universal uh, unmarked uh, identity and and these kinds of narratives uh, uh, are located in the home uh, privacy of the home or school factory gym colony it's not simply uh, uh, the village you have a number of stories in our collection uh, for example the unmarked identity of the meritorious student in uh, coming out as dalit the valued member of a scientific community in a story titled dust storm and uh, the administrator uh, are the the traveler uh, in waiting for visa and the fit uh, citizen uh, the factory worker and uh, 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 in, in uh, bagul uh, uh, stories so you have a number of uh, 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 situations where uh, uh, i think one one could say that the the desire is to be treated uh, as a normal uh, human being and the third uh, uh, uh uh point uh, uh because if it is uh, performing uh, the upper caste identity or performing a uh, castelessness and i don't know where to, to fit uh, uh, one of my uh, st- stories what is it eh? go ahead uh, so one of my uh, i was working in bangalore uh, uh, university uh, way back in 1995 one of my close friends uh, he uh, Yeah, he was uh, going with another uh, girl from a, a Gauda community, an upper caste community, and they wanted to get married. And he was also a Dalit uh, person, uh, my friend, but he is fair looking and also very uh, modern looking and very stylish guy when compared to me. I was because of my leftist background and all. I am just very uh, ordinary kind of looking. So before we uh, take this boy and girl and get married at some place and send them to some other place because Gaudas are very powerful. Uh, they are likely to kill you and so on and he was a student i am a faculty member so we went to their house and we wanted to check i said we will first verify their house and what is their strength and uh, they so we have a connection with the minister and so on. i went there and then uh, the girl is there the mother was there and the mother offered us uh, uh, lunch so we don't have lunch so then we had lunch and then uh, we both talked and we we searched and our plan was the next day the marriage is going to happen these people are going to run away but the family doesn't know and we came back so next day the the, the girl came and told me that that my, my mother asked me that one of the persons uh, who came to our house is a dalit and pointing at me so he said this here, so this person is a dalit and other person is not so why did you bring a dalit to our house so this is what I, that, that girl was asked the whole point was that my this uh, my friend is a dalit and we are going to get married uh, so this marriage is happening between the dalit and the gouda girl but that uh, mother suspected me so i asked her why how did she find out because the uh, nagesh uh, other friend his friend's name is uh, my other friend is also a, a dalit and how could uh, uh, she identify me as a dalit uh, so she said uh, that you have taken your plate and went to the uh, wash uh, wash area and clean the plate and kept it there so this is the old leftist practice that you wash your own plate so you pull a plate so then she identified and the other fellow my other friend was is he doesn't touch anything he kept it there and he behaved like a landlord so this is a moment where i <laughs> i really don't know how she uh, uh, identified but but what i learned was that that i really have to uh, perform certain kinds of ways of behavior at a certain kind of place so i cannot be a leftist in a upper caste gouda house Great. Uh, so, uh, cognizant of time, uh, I'm just going to read a very brief uh, excerpt from. Uh, I should mention that that a number, almost half of the uh, pieces in our collection are appearing in English for the first time, or have been written for this volume. So, uh, though some of the pieces are already well known, uh, others are uh, others will be quite new uh, to all of the readers. Um, And and the central character in this uh, this essay by Jai Prakash Kardam uh, that we've translated from Hindi um, takes us right into the heart of that that complex terrain between the pitiable object and the fearless Ambedkarite hero that, that Satya was talking about. So uh, this is this is from from Jai Prakash Kardam's essay Meri Jati or My Caste. Uh, just a bit from the beginning. In, in a, it had been just three or four days since I arrived in Allahabad. Thus far, I was staying at the home of a relative of my friend from Ghaziabad. In those three or four days, I went with some of my colleagues at the bank, 
working at, at, a, at a bank, national bank, to see a number of apartments for rent. When people learned that I was a bank employee, they were keen to rent to me. They explained their terms and gave me a tour of the rooms, but landlords must contain, collect information on their renters, so they asked me questions as well. They asked what district and village I came from, they asked about my family, they asked about my name, and ultimately they arrived at CAST. When I said that I'm a jock of a scheduled CAST, a sudden change overtook their faces. Their third eye opened. The hospitable warmth evaporated. They suddenly remembered that the room which a moment ago had been available and which had been all but given to me to rent was actually already rented out to someone else, or they suddenly recalled that their son or daughter had an upcoming wedding and after all they needed the room themselves to accommodate guests. And then uh, uh, Kardam goes on to describe how, uh, you know, he searches for apartments in vain for, uh, for quite some time. Uh, and a number of his colleagues encourage him, a number of his SC colleagues encourage him to, um, to just say he's of some other cast just for the function of, of getting, a, getting an apartment. Uh, but he refuses. And, and finally, uh, he, he meets an acquaintance, uh, a friend from the same region who, um, who's also a cast fellow and moves in with him. Uh, but this friend, whose name is Banke Lal, um, tells Kardam that, that listen, uh, the landlord here thinks that I'm of Varma. Uh, and it's under that, um, it's, it's only because of that, that that I have this place to rent. And then uh, Banke Lal and his family go off to a village for the wedding. So Kardam has the place to himself for about 10 days. And during that, the landlord happens to come by. So here's the, uh, here's the last bit. One Sunday evening, I was sitting on the veranda reading when the landlord, Surrender Srivastav, came up to me. For a little while, he spoke of trifling things. And then he asked, what caste are you? My impulse was to declare I am Jakov with my usual customary boldness. But then I recalled what Banke Lal had told me, that if the landlord discovers we are scheduled caste, no one will let us rent. I thought this is the difference, th this is the place where the difference between having and not having shelter is altogether dependent on caste. If I say that I'm a scheduled caste Jakov, Banke Lal might be made to clear out of his house. Secondly, Banke Lal lives with his caste concealed. He socializes with uh, the landlord's family and many others like him, eats and drinks with them, visits, mingles. Given all of this, if the secret were to emerge, uh, his position is likely to fall hard. And once a person's position has fallen, once people see him with contempt, then a garden of woes is planned. I was no less an advocate of caste pride, and though feelings of inferiority were not my nature, I could see that my speaking the truth in this moment could precipitate a crisis of serious proportions for Banke Lalji. Thus, though I did not want to, and though it opposed my own precepts, I said, I'm a jock. There were two calculations in my saying that I was a jock. First, there, were some, there are some jocks who take the title Verma. Second, all that stands between jock and jockdal is that soft second syllable. In case Surendra Srivastava were to discover at some future time that I'm not jock but jockdal, I could claim that I had actually said jockdal and that he must have misheard me. And Varmaji, this was Srivastava's next question. I was startled. Did Srivastava have some doubt about Bangalalji's being Savarn? His question gave my conundrum a further twist. <clears throat> I knew Bangalalji had claimed to be a Verma, but I did not know which Verma he had in mind. Jad Verma, Sunar Verma, Kayast Verma, or some other. After all, there are Jats who take the title Verma as well as Sunars and Kayasts. Surrender Srivastava's own elder brother used the title Verma. He offered the question like a dish of poison pudding. Somehow I had to keep it, to eat it and keep smiling. Let me just leave it there so that, uh, you know, you'll, you'll want to read the book to find out what actually happens. Uh, but there are certain lines in there that I think are worth keeping. Dish of poison pudding. How much can we have? Yeah, so I would like to, uh ask you to uh, at least read three uh, stories at some point of time. Quite uh, interesting. One, uh, Ajay Navare is taught to, and then of course, Boggles, uh, when I hit my cast, and then another fascinating story by uh, Ayappan from uh, Kerala, which is part of a collection uh, that we put together. It's titled uh, Madness. So I'm not going to read from the three stories because Tartum 
uh, uh, is set in the city uh, uh, in, in, in Delhi uh, uh, in a gym on which uh, location when she is inside the Dalit character an officer describes it, it uh, describes that location as a uh, sweet version of anonymity. Yeah. So I think I'll leave it at that. Then the, the, I think the amazing story that I really, really liked was when I hit my cash, where you have both the Ambedkarite kind of a character, the rebellious open uh, uh, kind of a character, Kasinath, and you have the character who conceals uh, the caste. So in fact, many times when uh, 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 the other characters try to find out his caste, so he goes on uh, speaking uh, in a language, uh, uh, I think, which really tells us that at the point of uh, independence uh, times, so this whole idea that we we are going to live without uh, caste as citizens and so on. So he replies to some one of those uh, occasions. I'll read these two lines and then go to the main uh, story, my madness. I am from Mumbai. I'm a graduate of the University of the Revolution. The people whom Manu rejected, whom he would have consigned to the dust heap, who brought this great country its freedom, for those from my city. I am one of those great worker warriors. My hands are the wheels of, of, of Bharat's progress, I said in chaste Sanskritized uh, Hindi. And, and many times he, he just goes on like, I'm a Mumbaiker. I fight the good fight. I give my life in the defense of the right. I have freed India from bondage. And I am now the strength. Got that? And he never answers what is his cast. He goes on uh, in this kind of a way. And then I think the, the main, uh, the most important uh, uh, story, which is not the normal useful, because these are straightforward narratives, both uh, the, the Tatu and this. Uh, this is a story, uh, Madness, by a uh, writer called Ajay uh, Yappan, uh, where uh, the main character's name is Krishnan, Krishnan Kuti. So Krishnan Kuti, uh, the, the scene is that there is a street and a lot of people, Panchayat president, his old friend, other people are gathered in front of his house and they're shouting at uh, uh, him and asking him to come. Uh, and there is a car, in the car there is a woman uh, sitting there and, and she's screaming, she's not mentally uh, sound. So they're asking Krishnan, please come and see the sister and then uh, come and take her to the hospital. So that is the contest. So the, I think of course Krishnan uh, never comes back, he closes the door and so on, but he has a narrative, self-narrative, a monologue of his own and he explains why uh, he never came out. I'll read only two uh, uh, parts of it. Uh, so he's explaining why uh, uh, the, the, that he, he did not uh, come out. Many residents of the quarters visit the hospital. Some of them will surely notice the difference between me and my relatives. Forget the mad woman. She is not the real issue. The issue here is the people caring for her, their appearance and mind will become the object of scrutiny. And then inevitably, my neighbors will comment, though Krishnan has by some chance become respectable, a well-known teacher, all the rest of his lot is awfully backward. And then uh, a little later, again, I, I read another uh, paragraph. Everyone would agree that when my, when my sister is ill and has been admitted to a hospital so close by, my wife would visit her. I think so too. But to state it simply, my wife happens to hate every single one of her husband's relatives and with no exception. Sure, it is unpleasant for me, but, but her reaction is genuine and quite understandable. Neither her skin color nor her looks would ever betray her lowly origins. So there really is nothing wrong in a revulsion for my relatives, the real descendants of the unkempt people who devoured the next, uh, the never, who devoured the meat of a dead cows is there. So in other words, she is passing off as, a, uh, uh, as an upper caste uh, woman. My daughter's case is more complex. She was born and is growing up in these upper class uh, quarters. So, the so she associates dark skin and soiled clothes with only beggars or Tamil migrant laborers. Sadly, my people happen to have these features. And he goes on in this way to explain why he never came to, to, to take care of his sister. Thank you. Thank you both very, very much. Um, I think this is incredibly rich and having you both in conversation with each other has been really wonderful. Uh, Murli, if you wanted to start with a few comments and then we can start uh, engaging with, uh, with our audience. Thank you. Yes, sure. Um, thank you, Anu, for inviting me to moderate uh, this uh, exciting session. 
I must say that I'm not uh, responding, but I'm moderating in some sense. So I'm going to keep it minimal, uh, but make some broad remarks. Uh, it is definitely an honor to be with Satya Joel at, uh, may I say, the revealing to a broad audience of your caste concealment project. Uh, and, and, and I think it's, it's going to be a phenomenal addition to what we understand about caste. Uh, because as, uh, as, as Joel also commented, there is simply not enough work uh, that is available in English uh, on the phenomenon of, um, I'm going to say caste passing, because that is the title of this session, but it's also got something to do with caste concealment, as, as, as we'll see. So your, um, your project is definitely much awaited. Uh, some scholars have noted um, caste passing, I would say, uh, in passing, uh, for example, uh, Gerald Berryman, very long time ago, he spoke about how identities can be and are manipulated uh, and how passing occurs to some extent in caste society. Um, more recently, some writings, especially in the diasporic context, have spoken about caste passing and we did mention that. So the work presented today is promising and I offered five entry points for further discussion about uh, this topic and what tells us about caste. And um, the, the first thing is, and, and I did write this before I uh, had a chance to, to uh, listen and, and be privy to all the wonderful rich things that you bring out. So pardon me if it's a little bit um, um, repetitive, but uh, let's, let's put it this way. There are shades of caste passing. This is my first point. There are shades of caste passing as you actually talked about in your recovered stories. So when is caste passing simply uh, not caste outing? Because caste outing is a term that is increasingly gaining some kind of a um, uh, traction, especially in the diasporic context. That is, is caste concealment tantamount to caste anonymity? Uh, when does caste passing then become caste misrecognition? Um, because caste identity, as we know, requires a context for its salience. So there is a space, a social space, which is also a temporal space uh, for caste ambiguity or even caste neutrality. And I think some of your stories already point to that. Uh, is there a difference between veiling one's identity, that is, I would call negative passing, uh, versus the active assumption of another's caste identity, that is, I would call a positive passing? Uh, and how are these two connected? Uh, is caste passing mostly about caste concealment? Uh, although I think you've definitely talked about the various shades of other things that come with it. And all this is crucial, I feel, to kind of map out uh, within the rich literary uh, genre that you're working in, given the inherent, I would say, caste curiosity that is part of Indian society. We all know within five minutes, within three minutes, the questions will come and the attempt to discover the other person's caste identity will usually take place. So India is uh, not only casteist, but it, it continues to be casteist by keeping caste curiosity as a un, um, unquestioned, uninterrogated category, except in journalistic pieces probably. So that's my first point. The second point is I think passing is also about a socio-psychological anxiety. Uh, these are anxieties of being outed as a stigmatized identity. And uh, most recently, Yashika, that's uh, um, work attests to that. But uh, I would also say it is anxieties about caste mixing and boundary monitoring by those who are invested in caste due to their privilege. Um, so are these two kinds of anxieties, uh, different kinds of anxieties, uh, not only in terms of the function they perform, for example, for subaltern caste, Dalit caste especially, uh, to gain access um, in some way to resources or at least not be discriminated against for opportunities. Um, but in the uh, other sense of, uh, for privileged caste, um, it is uh, also about something about sustaining a caste self. And uh, for example, can we then say that caste passing by Dalit groups produces a peculiar version of double consciousness uh, taken from Du Bois and if we can even play with that. Uh, but what about the caste consciousness of the privileged caste when they discover that 
caste is not based on some firm basis because caste passing is possible and probably is quite rampant and occurring right under their noses, right? To use a beautiful Indian um, uh, way of talking. Uh, so I do think that anxiety that, whoa, maybe this caste business is not as concrete as we think it is because look at the folks just going back and forth through all these uh, transgressed boundaries. My third point is, maybe you can say it's a more philosophical point, what is the referent of caste if passing occurs? Um, so to get to that, I think um, we need to think about does the notion of passing ironically reinscribe caste as a social category that is real or given in reality by saying that a person of caste X passes off as a person of caste Y, are we underscoring that the person is indeed of caste X? Uh, on what basis then do we reflect on such a claim about caste? Um, what does it do to caste the notion and social category when we identify caste passing as a social act? I bring this up since unlike race, race I say which has been within the scare quotes for uh, definitely more than a century, uh, I mean or at least more than half a century I would say, caste has somehow escaped those scare quotes. So the social constructivist move in race uh, has uh, significantly denaturalized race and also led to several strains of thinking about what it means to say that race is socially constructed. Um, this is not yet the case, I would say, at least not enough from my point of view about caste. Let me elaborate and maybe even provoke a little bit. So if the project of annihilation of caste has to carry some meaning today, we are faced with the persistence and even proliferation of caste identities. Um, in my view, this demands a serious denaturalization of caste. That is to show how caste is a social construction without any essence. Uh, and maybe that is a provocation. Here comes the anti-essentialist argument, right? Um, if so, then the first step to denaturalizing caste is to acknowledge that caste identities, all caste identities are very tall claims. That's what they are. They are in the order of fictions that acquire the fixity of fact. Consequently, we can ask, what does passing and identifying the act of passing, which is part of your project, mean for the project of annihilation of caste? Does caste passing as an analytical category bring back or reify the dubious authentic caste identity that is veiled in passing or concealed in passing. Such a questioning of caste identities brings up the related question of whether we can have caste identities without casteism. And this I know Satya has written beautifully about and argued for the move to think in the affirmative that yes, you could have caste identities without casteism from the perspective of building radical Dalit identities and reclaiming certain cultural objects. And I, I have written about my disagreement with Satya uh, with that position in the context of the beef festivals. Uh, but I think that is a productive engagement. My fourth point is this. Passing has had a long scholarly accounting within race studies. Uh, Joel beautifully uh, alerted us to some of those ways of thinking about it. But one of the ways I can think that it can become interesting for caste is by thinking about folk theories of caste. Um, this I think race theorists uh, who are nominalists or even uh, people uh, who are definitely in the side of social constructivism uh, do talk about folk theories of race. Uh, but if we talk about folk theories of caste, then despite the fact that caste can be shown to be but a really tall claim, that is a fiction, it is nonetheless real because it has real impacts and because it is brought into reality through casteist practices. Casteism, in other words, brings caste into existence at every moment. Uh, so this gets us into the realm of social constructivism proper and makes it important for us to think in terms of, I would say, how, when, and where does caste identity come into social being? Uh, and for this to happen, we need to stop assuming that caste is a priori salient, but to look for those social moments 
when it becomes salient. And I think that's what every story that you've mentioned thus far, just the snippets, actually talk about those moments when caste becomes salient, salient enough to conceal uh, even, right? We could call such moments as caste situations. Uh, so here, Joel has also added to our understanding through his work on caste by focusing on how caste is sometimes smelt out, literally smelt out, the odor of caste. That's, that's Joel's term. And he brings in that sense, uh, a sense that we usually don't think with when we think about caste. Uh, caste many times th uh, is thought in more complicated ways than race through visual identification or through nominal things like what is your name and things like that. Uh, but caste passing then can be seen as, I would say, a deferring of caste situation for the person who's passing, uh, but creates a tacit caste situation since it reinforces caste belonging because that person wants to belong somewhere else, even if to belong in a neutral caste concealed way. Uh, so if caste passing succeeds, uh, we could ask, does it make the fiction of caste a fact? since the person now signals belonging to another caste. Uh, is this a fair assessment of passing? I, I just want to provoke and be harsh on passing. And I am glad Satya has mentioned that there are several strands of Dalit thinking that also looks at passing very uh, uh, negatively, but for probably different reasons than I'm mentioning. I want to conclude with my fifth point. And I wish to bring in, not surprisingly, the notion of culturalization of caste. Uh, which I believe is a concept that alerts us to how caste persists today in society by camouflaging a status claim as merely a claim to being different. So a vertical, vertical claim is passed off as a horizontal claim. They're just different. They're not higher than you. Uh, that's the camouflaging of caste. In other words, caste persists because it passes off as cultural difference in an age of multiculturalism. Uh, culturalization in this sense depoliticizes caste. Uh, keeping this in mind, we could ask, how is a person who is passing doing the passing? Uh, or how is a person who is passing outed? And I think Satya's personal narrative starts getting into some of those things, as well as Joel's um, uh, story about the landlord, uh, Srivastava, coming and asking certain things. But uh, I think it's important to kind of see how outing as well as passing occurs, but we can note that in both cases, one primary mode of passing and outing is cultural. That is a person passes by doing things that are perceived to be done by the members of the other group that they wishes to pass for, uh, or not doing things uh, for which that group from where they come is supposedly known for. Um, but if we accept this to be the case, then are we legitimizing the ideology of caste as cultural identity? That is, are we accepting that Brahmins are what Brahmins do? But we know this to be false. Since the moment one is outed, it does not matter that the person is doing what Brahmins do. It only matters that the person is not a Brahmin. So I want to underscore that because it brings back an old argument by Walter Ben Michaels uh, in, and he put it in an aphoristic way and I'm going to tweak it for caste. So I'm going to say it like this. To be a Thakur, one has to do Thakur things. Say sporting a mustache if you are male. But to do Thakur things, one has to be born a Thakur. So I want that unsettling that Walter Ben Michaels achieved for race to be done for caste. And that was the reason why I came down very hard on the culturalization of caste as a depoliticizing thing, because in the end, it is birth and birth alone that seems to matter. No matter what somebody does or doesn't do, uh, no matter what someone eschews or what someone embraces, ultimately that set of questions in the two minutes is going to out. And we need to get to that. And in that sense, um, I don't think it would be harsh to say that caste passing aids the camouflaging of caste by celebrating tacitly the culturalization of caste. 
indeed as satya just mentioned a few minutes ago caste concealment is viewed quite negatively for a different set of reasons by um dalit groups it has more to do with the contribution it makes to the depoliticization of dalits um i really am honored to be part of the discussion i'll stop there and i welcome initial reactions from satya and joel if any or open it to the audience anu all yours fantastic thank you um i think we can maybe give joel and satya a chance to respond i think there's a lot on the table and um feel free to take up a couple of things and i'm sure in the meantime we will have uh people jumping in with questions i hope please do send in your q and a to us uh and i will try to mind um that space uh so that uh, we can have Joel uh, Satya and and Murli sort of focus on on this conversation but really thank you very uh, very much all three of you i think i'm i, I just want to pick up on something that uh, murli ended with which is this question of of, of both the political and uh, then this broader question that i think is posed by the question of caste and caste concealment which is can we ever become other I mean, in that kind of really broad, kind of philosophical sense, I think riffing off of what Murli just said, when and can we ever become other, right? And if this is a project, and I want to pose this as a project of the uh, the political, the aesthetic, and the ethical, in some sense, as these sort of three domains that the project Joel and Satya's project really seems to be moving between. And I wonder there, you know, what the work, in some sense, of the literary or the aesthetic really does. It seems to be a kind of middle domain, if I can put it that way, between this question of the ethical and the political. If the biggest question of the social is not just about imagining the other or the inability to imagine the other, I think, as Murli is very rightly asking, but there's other, you know, when and under what context can we become other? The second thing, just very briefly, again, drawing on this question of the political, I'm very struck by these two domains, sex and labor, as the two spaces where there is some kind of a transformation possible. So Akirmashe, you know, the idea of a, a, a quote unquote bastard child, where the, you know, the caste, you know, the name of the father and the body of the mother, right? And, and you see this in Baugul's Ai as well, right? Where it's, it's, it's the child coming into a kind of awareness, both of the corporeality of caste, but then also the sexuality of the mother, precisely in terms of the mother and the mother's needing to engage in a kind of sexual labor, right? In order to actually sustain the family. So sex, sexual intimacy and the possibility of, of uh, both kind of miscegenate, uh, miscegenation and radically challenging the question of what is caste seems to be one really crucial domain where questions of sort of the body, caste, sexuality, identity are being raised in the, in the project. The other is this uh, really beautiful illustration that Satya offered that um, it was his leftism that had him washing his plate before putting it away. Now it's red as something else, but it seems to me that, you know, the, in this long tradition, and one thinks about someone like Bagul, but the long sort of uh, caste class or the Dalit Marxist tr tradition too, and I'd love to hear a bit more about that. It is the fact of, um, of, of um, rethinking labor and the context, especially of manual labor and revaluing, re-signifying it, that also appears to be a way of addressing the question of caste. And so I just want to kind of bring up these two domains of sex and labor as the two sp possible spaces where some kind of a politicization um, is happening, but not perhaps in the terms of the Ambedkarite hero, right? Who must really engage in the Bildungsroman of, of complete transformation. Right, something that you're really pushing against. And then finally, I think I just wanted to ask in this context as well, a very different reading of, of uh, the, the, the Dalit literary as it were, uh, which is Aniket Zaure's argument about destitution, right? And his reading there is actually about the domain of the ethical and reads Bagul, especially as posing the dilemma of 
resolution in some sense, right, at the domain of the ethical, as really where the question of caste and what he calls sort of destitution, caste destitution, as um, working. So I wonder how you would you would um, respond to that other reading, um, and I think a very powerful political but also philosophical reading of uh, the, of the Dalit literary, much along the lines that uh, both you, Joel, and, and Satya are engaging in, but clearly on different terms. Um, but just to kind of, this was a way to uh, give people a chance to um, begin to ask some questions, but also I think to give Joel and Satya a little bit of time to collect their thoughts and respond. So maybe if the both of you wished to respond, and then we can take up a round of questions from, from the audience. I'm keen to get to the, uh, the audience questions. These are, this is wonderful material to think with. Uh, thank you for this. Um, and and uh, these are uh, certainly things we are um, wrestling with. Uh, I, would, I would signal that um, uh, we are thinking in our work um, about uh, Ambedkar's famous line about the reclamation of human personality. Uh, we're thinking about personality, personhood, um, and persona, the deep conceptual, um, the, the kind of deep structure of that concept in, in the mask. Uh, and the the um, you know in insofar as any of this uh, makes a trace on the um, legal archive, it is um, there. You know the the Indian Penal Code section four one nine is cheating by personation, not impersonation, but personation, a kind of older uh, term for what we now think of as impersonation. And the, there's, we find that the authors in these texts are doing some very interesting thinking on what it means to be a person and, uh, and how some of the experiments in self-presentation um, and, 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 and the performance of, of everyday life um, are, uh, are ways of exploring that reclamation of human personality uh, denied by um, denied by the caste structure. So, so we're we're deploying uh, caste concealment um, uh, uh, as, as, with fully cognizant that it's an unstable and problematic category. Uh, you know, that suffers the fate of of, of, of all Durkheimian social facts. Of, <laughs> so, so that that is that is very much there. Um, uh, and 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 just a brief note to to your last point about sex and labor. It's very striking in in the stories in the collection that sex is the precipice. Um, that that is when concealment becomes aria pa. It's a you know that that is that is where the game is up. Or or um, in, in fact, there are quite a few stories in which that that um, that is sort of the climax, as it were. Uh, um, where where everything is revealed. Yeah, thank you, Murali. And uh, Anu, I think these are a set of questions that we need uh, a, a lot of time to uh, uh, think through and very complex. And uh, it's also very difficult to uh, capture this. But one point uh, uh, that to, to uh, Murali, uh, I think broadly, I think I would uh, go with him on, on many of these points about uh, the culturalization and uh, uh, the folk theory of caste uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, I think overall in terms of this, uh, 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 his own uh, critique of caste uh, passing, I think there's more of a uh, uh, kind of a, uh, a realist reading in, in, the, in the sense that, uh, that caste uh, passing uh, reproduces reproduces uh, uh, caste order, and it also uh, kind of refers to a referent that there is actually a original 
uh, caste identity and which is past uh, and so on. So th this is, uh, 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 I, I, I think, I think some, uh, something that has to be uh, rethought because the moment if you have these situations of uh, performance, of passing and so on. So it's not in terms of uh, that, whether it is actually liberative, whether it is enabling or whatever in, uh, in, in this particular situation. What is happening uh, is that certainly that it really complicates and it really destabilizes uh, various kinds of situations. So it really tells about not uh, one individual crossing a caste or overall the caste identity being destroyed. It's more in terms of uh, both, it's a reflection of the larger structural inequality, how that inequality has been negotiated by various uh, kinds of people. And uh, in, in some sense, uh, if the caste, uh, uh, what is that, uh, what is it? castelessness or uh, uh, complete destruction of cannibalization of caste is the idea. But somehow I have a feeling that there is no uh, easy way out and directly uh, destroying caste. It has to be negotiated through the various points of time, various uh, various approaches in terms of whether it is uh, Ambedkarite, uh, anti-caste, uh, anti-Hindu, non-religious, secular uh, ways of doing it, are are uh, are both uh, the emphasizing uh, 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 inter-caste uh, uh, marriages, are are labor practices, uh, but also of uh, these kinds of uh, performances, particularly. Uh, in this case of performances, this, this cannot be read as uh, a real uh, narratives of people trying to pass off, uh, in, in particularly in the case of the Dali situation. And uh, I've given uh, my example and other examples, you don't even want to pass off or do anything, but, but you are within it and you are inside it, you outside it. You try to be outside it, but you are pulled inside it. So there is no way <laughs> that, that so it, it, it is a kind of a struggle and wrestling through which you want to come out of it and be a global citizen a normal person, a human being and so on. But, but there are different situations because caste is not what you think, what you would like to be. It is what the larger society thinks and what you want to think. So you want to think you are not a Dalit, but then a larger society thinks you, you, you are a Dalit. So this, I think, negotiations is constant, which is also, of course, linked to the moralist point is that it's larger structural, uh, economic and political uh, connections. It should not be totally culturalized. I think this is a very general kind of a response, but I'll... I'll take a look at uh, the more serious questions that have been raising. Thank you. Thank right. you both. Uh, just to get going, um, I'll, I'll raise two sets of questions um, that I think are, are related to where you ended, Satya. Um, and so one is, uh, it, is an interesting comment by, by Purna. Uh, it says, I'd like to pick up on the last point of the moderator from the talk. I get the feeling that everyone is passing but the passing of the higher is monopolized and protected as non-negotiable in the cultural domain. In this context, the claim to non-braided identity through decent dress, language, can it be considered passing? But I'm taking here the question that, you know, what is the upper caste doing uh, with, with passing? You know, if, if Brahmanism is in some sense going back to Ambedkar only power and, and, that's, and, and in that sense, uh, also, you know, th there are no real Brahmins. There is only Brahmanism in some sense. How might one think through that other side of this? The second, um, you know, uh, Satya talked about the question of, of kind of secular modes of passing or critique. So there are two questions from the other end. Uh, Rahul Zondale asks, would you consider religious conversions of Dalits to various religions as the practice of caste concealment? How would one understand uh, this, especially in the context of neo-Buddhist identity presented in many of the uh, Marathi Dalit writings? And I think this goes with uh, a, a, a question that David Lelleveld asks as well. How do you think about passing caste race beyond the bounds of Hindu versus Muslim, Christian, and other religious or community identities? So I think opening up a kind of another front in this conversation about where does one locate uh, the problematic of passing. Um, um, and, and, uh, and, and again, I think going back to that first question of, of kind of uh, the, the, the higher and the lower in terms of passing, Meena Danda offers a statement or a comment which says, it seems to me that passing is, is, is not becoming, it's just passing for a particular purpose at a particular point. 
surely one can pass back and forth. Uh, and so therefore, I think again, putting some pressure on this idea of what passing and caste concealment might um, get us to, to, to do um, in terms of analysis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me take the the religion uh, question. Thank you for that. That's that's uh, that's great and something that the book actually does bring out in certain contexts. Two of our um, stories. They're both they're both in the the short story section of the anthology. Feature uh, Christian contexts in the South, in Kerala and Tamil Nadu. Uh, and um, Christianity provides a uh, scene, a kind of social scene in both of these. Uh, it, it opens certain possibilities for an unmarked um, identity that is, uh, you know, that is that is more or less. Uh, and that's right. There's the rub, more or less. Um, uh, free of, of caste mark and caste stigma. Uh, and so these, these stories explore, uh, explore the less as opposed to the more of that. Uh, uh, so it's quite, so there's, that, that's a, there's a way in which I mean, so many of the characters in, the, in all of these narratives are um, uh, straining toward an unmarked, and, and potentially universal uh, form of belonging. Uh, and, and so, you know, religion in this here, Christianity, uh, but, uh, but in other places, other, um, Islam is not in one of these stories, but uh, as part of this broader project, we've also been doing some interviews uh, and some ethnography. Uh, and a number of interlocutors in, in uh, UP, for example, have spoken of um, uh, Islam as a means to escape uh, caste stigma uh, and, and who have actually talked about it in terms of uh, caste concealment. Um, uh, but also other categories like regional categories, Punjabiness, but the Punjab seems to uh, hold this place in the imagination, especially in UP, uh, and and writers writers in Hindi um, uh, in the collection uh, of, often speak of um, uh, a, a kind of uh, being able to speak a certain amount of Punjabi or to portray oneself as Punjabi is is a means to escape. Uh, uh, you know, certain everyday forms of, 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 of contempt. Yeah, so the, uh, the one point that I want to make is that this passing is, I think, taken literally. We don't know whether we, we are actually going to use the passing. We are only saying that passing and the debate around it is something that allows us to think of uh, uh, certain issues in the Indian context. Then the caste concealment as the idea. I think there the focus should be on, uh, for example, if you take the Bogle's uh, uh, story, this whole uh, mental agony and, and pain and the cruelty of the caste system. When you're talking about caste concealment, it's not so much in terms of how somebody is concealing and whether he will cross the caste lines or not and so on. So that, that the possibility that such a practice is still continuing. And for example, if you take this, uh, interesting uh, uh, story of new custom. You have a, a educated and uh, teaching in Delhi. You go to a, a wedding uh, uh, to a small village, stand at the uh, tea shop, and within a few minutes, you are stripped of all your, uh, I mean, completely clothes and language, sophistication. Finally, you are totally naked and shown that you are you are a Mahar, you are a Dalit uh, from some, somewhere else. So it's not that he is trying to pass off. He uh, is trying to conceal, he's not trying to do anything. But so there, I think you really have to think about what is the larger caste society and, and the structure and the cruelty of society that causes uh, this humiliation and this insult. And how does, how does this, these, these particular kinds of performances really, situations really allow us to think of the larger uh, context? I think that should be the focus than simply 
uh, because it could be religious conversion. It could be, uh, uh, you know, becoming a cosmopolitan citizen. It could be by doing certain kind of uh, labor. So there are many ways in which uh, people are uh, trying to, uh, you know, cross over and, and, and uh, become somebody else. Uh, but so caste concealment is one. I think in Dalit literature, what we really found was we have a number of scenarios where this particularly happens. We are curious why uh, they have to really manage this thing. So in that sense, the passing as not becoming uh, is an interesting observation. Lovely. Um, we, we have, um, um, and, and I think uh, maybe if you wanted to stick a little bit more with this, uh, also from sort of from the other end, as it were, from uh, the upper caste end of things and what that would mean, that would be really interesting as well. One of the questions that's come up a couple of times. Um, and then I think uh, the other one, perhaps, Joel, goes back to your um, opening point where you spoke about personation. So there's a question here about um, the ways in which legal structures uh, identified entire communities as unlawful through the Criminal Tribes Act uh, post uh, and post uh, in the post-independence period, the Habitual Offenders Act and so on. And I take this to be a question of how much of these legislations that criminalize um, or I suppose more broadly mark juridically um, with the power and the impact and the import of the state, how much of some of this, uh, how much does this push people towards forms of caste concealment? And here, I guess there is, it's opening up this uh, interesting relationship between kind of state and bureaucratic identity and identification on the one hand, and then the possibility of play and um, performance and enactment that both of you have also brought up. Um, but we we have, um, I think maybe we could take about 10 minutes and if maybe you could, uh, um, wanted each of you wanted to think about uh, offering uh, slightly longer uh, comments and responses and also kind of uh, final words, we could do that. And then I'll go to Murli as well and ask him to do the same. Uh, because, uh, and, and then, you know, we'll, we'll try to end by about 11.45 uh, as promised. Right. You do answer that, I will also add. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for this. And this, you know, this this uh, takes us to very much um, uh, Henry Louis Gates's argument regarding, um, you know, he's he's pushing back against the kind of um, you know, celebration of passing in literary studies as, as creative deconstructionism uh, and, and saying, no, look, there, uh, you know, uh, race is a social construct, but a construct with teeth uh, that bite through time and the legal structures uh, make this a, a most formidable social and political fact um, so that, uh, you know, one cannot um, speak of this kind of creativity without attention to uh, the, you know, consequences on the body, the consequences in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of what the state can do to you. Uh, and so that, that is kind of always there. And, and the trick then is to, you know, think about um, how these performances of caste status can be both at the same time you know, a, an evanescent bouquet of signs that, uh, uh, you know, that, that sort of anyone with a canny eye for style can uh, perform, uh, right? And, and so the, the, one of my favorite passages from um, Bagul's story, When I Hid My Cast, is, is toward the beginning when he describes first showing up at the workplace. This is a, a railway yard and he's, he's a new employee there. Um, so he, I show up uh, flowing like a morning breeze when I saw a group of workers in front of me and called out to them. In chaste and elegant Gujarati, I introduced myself. Ranjod was uh, immediately ready to rent me a room and the workers with him began to look at me with admiration. They were taking in with a look of awe, my coat, topi, dhotar, Golapuri slippers, the book of Mayakovsky's poems in one hand and the trunk to which my bedding was tied. The respect on all their faces, their curiosity, all this added to the joy I felt in getting a job. So you have that, 
you know, I mean, a, a bouquet of signs, right? A, a, an ensemble of, of significations that, um, it, you know, the, and, and yet at the same time, right? The, there's the state with its category of scheduled caste and the system of reservations that uh, is based on that, that uh, is in force at the very same moment. So the, the trick is to, you know, not lose sight of either of these, um, aspects uh, uh, when, when thinking through the category and its uh, categorical version, this, these kind of attempts to uh, rebel against the reign of category, um, category that has hard edges, uh, but that yet also can be manipulated um, and reworked in, 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 in so many ways. Yes, so I have a story uh, to tell you about this legal uh, recognition. I think Murali would like this story. story that uh, there is a nomadic community called Budaga Jangalo in Karnul district in Andhra Pradesh. So they wanted a caste certificate. This is a huge problem for many of us to get this caste certificate. So they went to get a caste certificate, but they're all looking very modern. So the RDO, the revenue official said, you, you don't look like Budaga Jangalo. Yeah. So you have to come back as a Buddha Gangalu, then I'll give you the certificate. So then they said, what do you mean by that? He said, you don't look like, so you have to look like a Buddha Gangalu. So these people went back, all the educated people, they're doctors, they're other people, a medical student and so on. They all dressed up in their traditional kind of dress and they walked to the office. Then I showed him that we are Buddha Gangalu. We still have all those remnants, all those dress and so on. Then they got the certificate. So this was, <laughs> this was a legal, the legal system reinforcing certain kinds of stereotypical uh, cultural. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, if, yeah, do you want if you are, to? If you are done, I, I just wanted to say in all probabilities, the Buddha, the, 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 the Buddha the Dingalu, right? I, I'm not saying it right. Uh, they may have been assisted by an anthropologist who documented what the Buddhist Dankalu do. <laughs> yes. so it is a very strange world we live in, uh, where they have to perform themselves according and through the eyes of experts who say who they are, in order to get what is rightfully theirs. I think it is a tragedy comedy in a, in a way. But I take all your points. I think this discussion is the beginning of uh, um, new and deeper insights into how caste actually works, and uh, I look I look forward to definitely reading and having more public discussions around your works. Um, <clears throat> and thank you all very much. Uh, maybe maybe I could I could take thirty more seconds to say something. Of course, please. About, about yes. Mira's Mira's very important question and Geeta Patel's intervention. Yes. Ooh. I wanted to actually bring those two up and see, I mean, we can take a few more moments, but you know, and, and then I think there's an interesting question by Bhagwati Prasad that I think also relates to this, but uh, Gita sort of continues or wants to continue on this conversation on becoming and asks us to turn to queer racialized theory. What would Western's notion of rendition that plays out the intersection, plays out intersection offer this discussion where identity and identification are constantly modulated and I would imagine are unstable um, sort of, you know, poles and different facets and feature surface at different points. Concealment then will arise differently through different conditions, which include political economy and juridical conditions. And I think just thinking about that and the uh, a kind of brief history of Dalit literature almost that I think Joel and Satya offer uh, through the work on concealment, here is this interesting question by Bhagwati Prasad. The amazing lyricist Shailendra did not discuss his caste background. He wrote songs with deep sense of insight into inequality, oppression, and collective expression. He's coming from a particular mode of politicization too in a certain time. Only now his son has brought up his caste for, a th for thinking on his lyrics. How would you read this? And, you know, similar sets of questions around this uh, um, autobiography, biography of a Dalit communist that uh, myself and my colleague Vandana Sonalkar have just translated where the instability of caste and class is actually what produces 
experimental writing, new modes of, of uh, literariness. You know, Bagul by no means a, a traditional communist or a Marxist, but there is Gorky, there is Mayakovsky, there is the world of kind of experiment and thinking, you know, just shattering the modes of representation. And those modes, it seems to me, are, are occurring or are available to us at different points in time in very different ways with a very different kind of availance. So the discourse of labor in the past is no longer, it seems to me, either available or necessary or even um, something that one embraces any longer. But there's something else sort of taking its place. And I think I agree with Murli that uh, the work that you're doing in this volume I think is asking us and is giving us an entirely new vocabulary, a new repertoire, uh, a new set of words and languages. So um, you both really have the last words and I'd like to end with both of you, but um, by, by just marking our enormous appreciation and gratitude for this really remarkable conversation to be able to do this on zoom without seeing each other and to have a hundred people online but to maintain this level of, of kind of serious engagement is is really a gift so thank you both but joel and satya you have the last words thank you so much uh to uh Yes, I, I really do appreciate this, this uh, Mina's question about passing back and forth and, and um, what these latter questions have suggested even about a kind of intergenerational passing back and forth when, when uh, you know, a famous lyricist can uh, see, be sort of brought back into a caste discourse after having um, you know, uh, uh, moved arguably beyond it, whether, you know, but, but how to read that, right? Um, and whose interpretation of, of that is, is, is to be, uh, you know, to, to be valorized the, um, uh, you know, this in, in musical performance, this is a, a major debate, um, whether to um, Bismillah Khan, the great Shehnai artist, right? Um, there are moves in the Halal Khor community to say he was one of ours, let us recognize him as, um, you know, as a Dalit Muslim. Uh, and there are others who say, no, let us not, uh, you, know, re, you know, reapply the, the, the stamp of caste. Um, and, and so one, again, is brought to these, you know, slippery categories of, of um, more or less universal categories. Uh, but thank you for that. And um, thank you for this opportunity to, to share our work in progress. And uh, it's, it's, you've given us so much to uh, think with. Yeah, so uh, I thank uh, Anu and uh, Murali and all the participants. And we are really in the uh, very early stage. I must uh, admit this, we really have to think a lot. And thank you for asking uh, a very, very difficult uh, kinds of questions that really uh, help us develop this uh, project. And since it, uh, we have been mentioning various uh, musicians, let me also mention this name of, uh, I think Murali would know, Elia Raja, a very well-known uh, music director from Tamil Nadu and is famous uh, in South India. And he filed a case against uh, somebody who said he's a Dalit. Of course, Elia Raja is a Dalit, but, uh, uh, but he, he completely disagreed and he filed a case and I think he won the case, saying that I would like to be what I am, and I'm not. I cannot be named. So with that, I think mm -hmm. I'll end. Um, thank you all. This is really fantastic. Um, we have um, Satya, a fan <laughs> mail. Uh, people wanting to know if they can contact you, and I think your your pretty easily available online uh, in mm -hmm. terms of your email address. A couple of uh, people have asked for, for some citations to the work that was mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. If you're open to people reaching out by, by email, I'll just uh, encourage people to do that. Uh, yes. But um, really extraordinary conversation. I want to thank all three of you and uh, to be continued. And please join us next week. We're going to try to do this every Thursday morning. 
And so next week we will um, have people who are thinking through image. Uh, so Prabhakar Kamble and uh, Y.S. Aloni, who will be um, taking up questions of aesthetic experiment.